everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Janelle Walker. I'm the Winter Sports Specialist from the U.S. Forest Service. This is Erin Nesser. She's the Assistant Forest Planner. We're both co-team leads on OSB Subpart C. Um, again, like we're going to conduct this meeting kind of like we did the last one. It will be, uh, we have a um, PowerPoint that we'll present to you that has some additional information that we've received from the summarized comments. Um, we are in the pre-scoping phase, and um, so if you have provided comments to us previously, you don't have to provide those same comments again. But when we move into the formal scoping phase, you'll probably want to <coughs> provide us comments again, correct? Right, so they have okay. standing. So, so, have standing. so um, we do have uh, the PowerPoint. Afterwards, we're going to conduct it like the workshop. We're going to unroll the maps. Uh, we have post-it notes again if you have additional comments. Um, or if you have new comments, we'd like it if you just put the post-it notes on the paper and write your comments down and then we will be able to summarize them later. And we'll be able to answer any questions and hopefully have some new questions come up so that uh, we can address them. Um, I could, do you want me to move over and? I guess so, yeah. And also, if anyone is not, I think most of you have actually heard this all before and is, are on my email list, but if there's anyone who isn't on the Forest Service email list for this project and wants to be, you can pass this around. Um, like I said, I think most of you are, just so we make sure that you get all the updates about this project. Um, so I'll try to do this quick, because like I said, I think most of you have, have heard this. Um, most of you have been at the meeting, but we do have some more maps and some more kind of just thoughts to talk about. Um, what we're doing now is, uh, the NEPA analysis for basically snow or OSV travel planning on the forest, travel management. So over snow vehicles in this case means anything that's motorized and has tracks. Um, okay, go ahead, Janelle. Oh, next slide. Oh, next slide. I'm sorry. Next slide, you know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, this is just the Winter Recreation Summit process. We're in the stakeholder presentation, public meetings, and input section. Hopefully we can use this along with the town and with our stakeholders to get down to some action. Next slide. So what is over snow vehicle use designation? It's basically, like I said, travel management for the whole forest. We have to decide what areas of the forest, or the forest supervisor, the decision maker on this, has to decide what areas of the forest will be open, closed, or otherwise restricted to over snow vehicle use. Next slide. Um, <coughs> Um, we're also going to consider staging areas, minimum snow depth requirements, and any vehicle type regulations that would, would be different between different types of vehicles. And things like signing and trail maintenance have to be included in part of this and included as part of this and analyzed as part of this. Our, our current kind of way of thinking about it is start what we have now and see what's not working and, and change what isn't working. The timeline for this. As Janelle said, we're currently in the pre-scoping period. We don't have our proposed action done yet. And we're hoping to hear input from people. We have heard a lot of input from people. We've gotten a lot of really great input. And just finish up with that until, and then come out with the proposed action sometime in April. Um, and then complete the draft environmental assessment by the end of 2016 and have a final decision by the end of 2017. Next slide, please. And just so you know, some of the data collection we've been doing for the past 20 years or so, as long as we've been getting these, um, the, our, our grooming system is paid for by state OHV funds. And ever since we've been getting that, we have to do monitoring to look at the effects of our, it's our grooming system, so it's only in the groomed area. Um, we've done other areas too, but uh, we've been doing monitoring for soils, botany, animals, um, and use cultural and cultural for the past 20 years. So we have a lot of information about, like I said, mainly the groomed areas, but not just the groomed areas, about any effects that they're, they're having on those resources. And just for this process, this year we've been trying to get numbers of snowmobiles out there because um, we don't really have a good handle on that. And so we've been, we have counters out there to count how many snowmobiles are going by on some of these trails. And again, that's mainly on the groom trail system. We've also had people going to trailhead, not just the groom system, but anywhere people park with snowmobiles. And we've had people going there main, on the weekends and on weekdays too throughout the winter to count how many people are using these areas, uh, motorized and non-motorized users. 
So trying to get a really good idea of who's using these areas and for what purpose. All right. Which trailheads are they? Which, which trailheads are you monitoring? We have, a, we have an infrared counter at Cindershed. We have one at, it, formerly, it's the Caltrans Lookout. We have one um, off of the scenic loop, and then we have one at the uh, Dead Man's Snow Play area. That's three. No, she said four. four. The cinder shed, yeah, the Caltrans, um, and those are where we have counters. And then what, I mean, the trailheads that people are going, is it just pretty much anyone or anywhere where people park with snowmobiles? Yeah, we have, right, and we have a log for our manual counters we've had people going out, and that has eight or nine trailheads on it. Um, and I can provide that to you with the, right. what the list is. I can't think of it all off the top of my head. And on the south zone, so this is a forest-wide project. On the south zone, we have people that um, just kind of regularly patrol trailheads. And on the south zone this, this year, there really hasn't been much snowmobile use. But when they see it, they, they record it. But um, they haven't really recorded anything so far um, this year. Uh, so, um, and that's one thing, it, it, some of the organizations and especially the local, uh, the city and the county, we're trying to get with them to see if they have any historic monitoring of, of use numbers. Uh, because that's definitely something in the past we haven't had. You know, we have a general idea of the use and we have a guy who's out there every day and he knows who's out there, but we don't have a real uh, systematic way of counting. So we're hope we're, that's what we're doing this year. All right, so the project area is the entire forest. Basically, every bit of the forest that's not wilderness, we're not reanalyzing wilderness or looking at snowmobile use in wilderness, another law has decided that. But basically, everything else we're looking at to see what should happen with snowmobiles there. Um, even the areas with low snow, we're looking at what, what should we do about snowmobiles in the area, that in, the, in the case that there is snow there. So it's the whole forest all the way down to Menanchi, um, which is down here, including the east and west side of the forest. And, uh, okay, next slide. And subpart C requires that you analyze, you know, open, whether it's open, closed, or otherwise restricted to snowmobile use on all parts of your forest that receive adequate snowfall. So that's what it says. <coughs> so that's what I'm looking at the whole forest, because in some years, the whole forest does receive adequate snowfall. But this is a map, not, this is just an illustration to show, this is a map using some data, it's, I think it only goes up through 2000, so it's a little bit outdated data, but it's, it's the PRISM data set from the University of Oregon, or Oregon State University, and this is um, areas that receive an average more than 12 inches of snow, total, total, so not all of them, not depth, but total snowfall. And this was just for us to get an idea, you know, what part of the forest does receive snow? And this is 18 inches. Um, so that's just, like I said, that doesn't mean anything. It's not that that's the only area we're looking at. But in trying to see kind of where people usually can use snowmobiles, that's, that's the area that, you know, we can also do 24 inches. We can do 4 feet. We can do 5 feet. But this is just what we looked at to start with. And it really does, um, this one probably corresponds best with where people actually do use snowmobiles a lot. Um, you know, out here people go in the Glass Mountains. In years when there's enough snow, maybe go to the White Mountains. Um. All right. Next slide. So current OSV management. Um, this is the map I've been showing. Is the current management? Anything in red is currently completely closed. The purple up there by Mono Lake is restricted to on roads. And um, these orange things are our trails, our group trails. And everything else is open, except for open. this hatch, this cross hatch is wilderness, so obviously that is closed. Um, but can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. When you say a little less than half the forest open to cross country OSV is, that is the forest as it occurs outside of wilderness? Or does that include? That's the open? entire forest, yeah. Because the number that I came up with was more like 70% is closed, not a little more than half, so. Maybe it's after the meeting you can explain to me. Yeah, how I can. So upon your number. everything that is, um, so it's not just outside of wilderness, it's including the wilderness. Everything that's cross-hatched or red in this is what I used in my calculation, and I just added it up, and it, it, it adds up to about, um, well, yeah. 
basically wilderness plus about 50,000 acres outside of the wilderness is close to snowmobilius right now. A lot of that stuff is accessible. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of that isn't, you know, a lot of it includes the whitening of mountains, which rarely receives enough, you know, some years does, but usually doesn't consume enough snow. But even if it does, you have, even the vegetables can't make it to some of these areas. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We, uh, yeah, we haven't done any sort of like slope or just, yeah, absolutely. A lot of this isn't. The vital area is much, much smaller. Yeah, absolutely. Than what is being Absol yes, it is. Um, definitely. So we, we haven't done that math, but honestly, the area that we see the most snow is probably about 400,000, 300,000 acres in a good year. Um, but in a big year, it's a lot more. Um, so this is just, so, and, and we do have maps on the tables for people that do want to look at them. I've, I've zoomed it, because I know you can't really tell on these maps what area, what the areas are. We have the whole forest map over here. Again, it's at a scale you probably can't see, but on the maps we have blown up of, of the Mammoth <coughs> area and then in this area by June Lake. So this is just showing the north part of the forest, uh, Lee Mining Canyon and June Lake, the current management there, and Mono Lake. All right, next slide. This is the Mammoth area, and it's showing the trails and the trailheads and the closed areas. And also, uh, you know, as you know, Tamarack is is only open for a really short window after April 17th until they plow the road. Next slide. Rock Creek is currently closed, basically uphill of the snow park. Except for the the permit, he does have a permit, and they just snowmobiles a lot up there. Next slide. That's the White Mountains. So right now the White Mountains, just so you know, um, the, ancient, the ancient bristlecone pine forest in our 1988 uh, plan, they said it was close to snowmobile use, except for the White Mountain Research Stations over there. But for public snowmobile use, recreational snowmobile use, it's closed. This area was open, but since they did the wilderness, it made it, made it inaccessible. You can't get there. So I, we call this closed because it's it's not real it's not truthful to say it's open because there's actually no way to get there without going through a closed area. So adding that wilderness, it's like really closed out of this area. So that's what's going on in the White Mountains right now. Again, in a lot of years it doesn't get enough snow, but when it gets a lot of snow, people used to really like to go in that area. Um, other current management, uh, we have a decision that was made maybe three or four years ago by the ranger here um, to build a new snowmobile and a uh, winter and summer staging area up here at this is Shady Rest Park, so out here on this road. Um, this map isn't quite what the final decision was, but I couldn't find a good one. But it basically, they were going to have people park here and snowmobile out of here. And this road would be plowed. And so that decision is on the books. We haven't implemented it. Um, it hasn't been put into place, but here's just some conceptual drawings of kind of what it might look like. Uh, a big parking area with enough room for trailers to pull through, uh, a, uh, a bathroom and a, uh, a ramp so you could take your snowmobile right off your truck. So that's on the books, so that's another man snowmobile management that we, we have going. Um, and we have we have heard a lot of great input from the public so far, and we've summarized that, and, and um, we're bringing it to our line officers next week. And um, you know we've heard a whole, and I'm not going to go over everything we've heard at all because it's a lot. It's a, it's a huge amount of uh, information and, and recommendations. But uh, just site specifically, the areas we heard most about were the, the number one place was San Joaquin Ridge, from you both all types of users. Uh, the Tamarack Ski Area from all types of users, the Tioga Pass Area, and a little bit about the Sherwood. So those are kind of the, we got a whole lot of general comments about kind of overarching ideas about, um, you know, pro and anti-motorized use, or just, just things that we needed to analyze. And a lot of it was, you know, you need to really look at this in your document. Um, but in these areas, what we heard is, you got to close them to snowmobile use because we want to ski here, or please keep them open. We really like the snowmobile here. And so that's kind of the, what, what we've heard about. The, these are recreational issues. These areas that we heard site specific, they weren't you know, natural resource based mostly. In these areas, it, it was mainly recreational. A lot of people brought up um, resource issues in the Tiger Pass area. 
Okay, next slide. And um, so, uh, it, you know, uh, being a land manager and having to make decisions about this, it's very difficult. We have no rules about how to choose between competing public values. It's people's values that they're talking about here. And so that's what the Forest Service has to take in all that and, and try to balance it. Um, and so this is another map I made that, I don't know if it's helpful, but so this kind of light blue, it's a little hard to see up here, but it just looks kind of like it's the map ends. But this is the area, I just randomly chose four feet of snow. So this is the area that on average receives four feet of snow, you know, until again cumulative, not all at once. So basically what this is, a map of the areas that either in a low year or late in the season um, still have snow. And those are the exact same areas that people commented about because that's where, you know, in a, in a low year, that's the only place there is to go for everybody that wants to do winter recreation. And so that is where most of the comments were. Um, and so, like last year, well, I don't even know if you could snowmobile last year, but um, late in the season, the only Grim Snowmobile Trail that's still usable uh, goes to the San Joaquin Ridge. And so a lot of people use that area on snowmobiles, and that's why there's a lot of people that were commenting about it. Um, so, oh, that would be interesting. All uh, right, next slide. Can I ask another question since you had that map? Yeah. You. When you're looking at the user differences of opinions, and we use, say, the San Joaquin Ridge as an example, one of the big issues between skiers and the San Joaquin Ridge, well, first, most of the skiers and some of them don't have issues. Right. It, um, but when you look at that, over the years that I've been involved, and I've been involved an awful long time in this, um, snowmobiles have been restricted to an ever smaller and smaller until now we only have the road. And I can understand how if you're a skier, that might irritate you because you want to use the groomed road as well. So since we've now created wilderness in this process, will you be able to look at things such as moving the quiet sports off of that road because snowmobilers cannot go off the road and making a, another trail is it's possible I used to ride it um, that could then be managed for the quiet sports to eliminate that conflict a big part of the conflict has been in the planning process where we have forced motorized into an ever smaller area and then the non motorized want to inhabit the same area because of the grooming and everything else so in this process, rather than looking at closure for motorized because there's a perceived conflict, uh, are you able to look at how you can mitigate those by moving the non-motorized folks off of the trails that we have slowly been restricted down to? I mean, one of my favorite rides used to be from the San Joaquin Ridge straight out to Crater Flat, cross country. Of course, I can't do that anymore. We've created wilderness. Well, the cross-country skiers don't do it because it's not groomed. So you have created an actual issue in what we would call the Miracle Mile, or everybody has a different name for it, uh, through the planning process. In this process, will you be able to look at, because this is OSVs and you're not looking at uh, Shane's mare or, or uh, human power, mm -hmm. will you be able to look at that in a ways to alleviate without more you know, I already call the Indian National Forest a forest of closures, so um, without creating more closures and further restricting what was once a wide open playing field. We, we can. We can look at that in this. This is over, you know, this is, you know, the subpart C is about motorized recreation, but there's nothing that stops us from saying, yeah, we're going to build a new cross country trail through here. Um, you know, grooming it, as you know, you know, that's, that's obviously what they did in the Obsidian area, as you, you had a big hand in that. Um, providing an area with state OHB funds to help reduce the conflict, an area for cross country skiers. And we could look at some another area like that here in this process, yeah. So in the process, then, would you also be looking at how to not have the motorized public pay for it all? Because yeah, I mean, now they have. Right, absolutely. Is, yeah, like some sort of fee program for cross country users. Yeah, we probably wouldn't look, we wouldn't go into that here. Um, it, but if people bring it up, you know, we could, that could be a different process. And people did, you know, we got comments about that. You know, why don't you make 
like what they do in Southern California, where everyone has to pay to park in the forest to, to provide some of these services. Because, yeah, right now there, there isn't money to groom cross country trails, except within, you know, when the town pays for it or when someone's doing a volunteer. I think we're going to deal with that later today, too. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we can we can add a little more. We can add as much as we want to this, but at some point, it would be totally outside the scope. Like a new fee program for the whole forest would be outside the scope of this. But providing cross country trails could be within the scope. So, just right. to follow up on that, is so if a, say, a route is, is to be designated as a non motorized route, uh, but you still need to groom it, that grooming has to be part of this decision. It would be, yes. And Just the maintenance, the, main, the tools are necessary yeah. for the maintenance if those are motorized, would be, and that would have to be part of this. Yeah, decision. and realistically, the forest is not going to, well, I don't know about that. We don't do much grooming of cross-country trails without some sort of outside fund. What you grew no trails about. Right. <laughs> For cross country, yeah. Well, no trails of any sort, right. And cross country trails, because there is no funding source, and we've gotten a lot of comments about that, you know, that's just because there's no funding source doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. Well, sorry, we have no money to do it. Um, that's, that's why I don't know who <laughs> right. Yeah, we just don't. So, what, so what realistically, we're not probably going to be analyzing grooming new areas for cross-country use, but we could do something like analyzing, designating new trails that could be groomed in the future for cross-country use to help separate some of the use and reduce conflicts. Although, like you said, and I wanted to put up here and make this point, we got a huge number of comments. It's not on this one, it's on the next slide. We got a whole lot of comments. We really like the system that's going on here on the Indian National Forest in the winter. We, we, get, we, we almost, not overwhelmingly, by any means, but at the public meetings we've had, people said we really like that there's group trails now. It really helped reduce a lot of the issues, resource and conflict-wise, for the OSVs. I mean, this happened 20 years ago, but you know that really, you know, people. It really helped. We really like it. There's great cross-country access. We get along. There aren't that many conflicts. We really have heard that from a lot of people. So I don't want to pretend this is a huge conflict issue, but a lot of the written comments we got do do have a lot of different views. So other I have one more question on that. I'm sorry, okay. I apologize. Yeah. <coughs> this is one I don't know the answer to, and okay. I knew the answer already. Is it possible in wilderness to groom for non-motorized with a forest order that would allow that, or because it's a motorized groomer, is that precluded even for management? Uh, we can you know, there are areas where there is motorized access only for emergencies and management. Right in closed areas already. In wilderness, is there a way to, because we brought the wilderness so close to the road's edge, um, is there a way administratively to create that in that and only use the motorized for that grooming purpose? No. No. OK. No. Um, it's, it's usually, when we do allow motorized and motorized, it's usually for a, it wouldn't right. be for recreation. Right. It wouldn't be to make someone's recreation experience better. Right. It would be to really protect some sort of endangered species or something. So no, that's it's a good question, but no. Thank you. But there is a way to build in um, a window for the potential of an outside funding source to be brought in to, to groom. Oh, absolutely. Outside of wilderness. Yeah, absolutely. And we have that. We have that in, um, you know, in the Obsidian Dome area, it's, it's paid for with state funding. The course service or someone else does it. In the Shady Rest area, I think the town pays for it. Town pays for it. Town pays for it. And in Rock Creek, it's a private entity that pays for it. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, we we're very open to those suggestions. I think. No, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, absolutely. And I say these things. I am the planner. I'm the person that does the writing and the editing. I'm not a decision maker. Just Janelle's not a decision maker. But we've heard that, that that's something the forest is is open to. Right. Um, some of the other more general input, we've heard you know, a lot of concern over the effects of wildlife and air quality. Sorry, you can't read that. Um, and the noise, you know, asking us to please analyze the noise because that has that's one of the far reaching effects of snowmobiles. Um, and a lot of uh, people have brought up the minimization criteria from the travel management rule to make sure we, we address that and pay attention to that in our analysis and in our decisions. All right, next slide. Um, and then 
you know, lap that bike. So we did that from two people on the groom trails, because currently they're not on any groom trails, no mobile or Nordic. Um, just some, a lot of comments about the NEPA process and how we need to do it. And like I said, the last one, we've, we've heard a lot of positive things that people appreciate how the system is run now, with a few exceptions. Um, okay. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to present. Does anyone have any more questions? Um, so in terms of uh, these maybe kind of boneheaded, quite sort of obvious questions, uh, but is it safe to assume that you guys are analyzing federal lands, anything that has to do with federal lands? Right. And so our map showed, you know, Mammoth, the town of Mammoth closed. That's just so there's not this weird gap, but we have no say over that. Okay. Have, so that's, so the second question that becomes, the town of Mammoth Lakes has done uh, a variety of planning efforts. Uh, the, the collaborative effort uh, in the Sherwin's, the SHARP document, addressed uh, snowmobile use. And I think it would probably make sense for your process to be as thorough as possible for the town, take the inventory of all the work that it's done, uh, and make sure we send it to you so that we can publicly, everybody knows, these are the things that the town and the community is invested in to make sure you have that as part of your baseline data. Is that Fair thing to say we should probably do? Yes, yes. Okay. It would be great to have those. Those are not, as you know, you know, top, but just you know, those are not binding on the Forest Service. Of course. We were part of it, I sure. think, and agreed. We were, yes. General, you know, I wasn't so I don't know, I understand. But the general um, you know, concept, but that is not currently binding on the Forest Service. If we incorporated it and said this is now binding on the Forest Service, we could do that. Okay. In part of this process. I don't know if we would, but it's very good to have that information so we can see, you know, make sure we consider that and include it in our plan. So I think the town and the community, I think we've looked to take some kind of action to get all the things that we've done and, and formally get it to you guys. Yeah. Um, another thing I've heard is, I think that we might have talked about this, is that because this forest has never gone through a process like this before. Well, we did, I guess, in the early 90s. Okay, but there, there are a lot of documents. Oh, yeah, there's a lot there's of, a lot of documents. Yeah. And so in Mammoth Lakes, there are a lot of documents from the Forest Service that get very kind of granular about the Sherwin's Meadow or like what happens in the lakes basin and administrative uses and all the rest of it. Some of these things that we have in the library, they're not signed. We don't know if they're useful. But I think you guys are hoping to roll everything up and have this decision be pretty definitive across the forest, correct? Yes, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking it would be useful also to kind of get that inventory, a lot of those documents that people don't know what the standing of these things are, and, and they may not be applicable, but to, put, to get those into your process so you can say, we've looked at all these things, and when the forest supervisor makes a decision, this is the kind of definitive ruling, uh, and all this other stuff has been yeah, it will, yeah, because we have a whole bunch of different forest orders about different areas on the forest. They may be contradic 20, contradictory, yeah. they, don't, they don't, so it's important to get all this stuff cleaned yeah, up and straightened up. Yeah, that's part of the real part of this that's going to be really useful for us is to get all those regulations and management and everything in one place for, for OSB use. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah. Just a general question, and, and I don't want to open a can of worms, but are there, are there aspects of this summer travel planning process that are there lessons learned or were there pitfalls that you guys hope to avoid this time or <laughs> I mean I yeah I don't know exactly how to yeah I know you're saying um, conversation but. yeah absolutely I I wasn't involved with that one which is kind of a, probably sad not sad but it, it makes it harder but I am um, and Susan the one who was in charge is gone but Marty's still here and I've been looking at it extensively just for that purpose it, it's a little bit different animal, but not, you know, it's the same general idea as travel management, it's just winter travel management. So I am, but if you have any particular um, instances or, or ideas you think that... I'll just, I'll just add one thing to that is the key lesson of that whole process was a collaborative effort that made that decision possible. And I'm, I'm assuming, and it may be helpful to say to the public, that the degree to which the public and the interested parties can work collaboratively outside of the very formal and rigid decision-making process that you're going to go through to come up with a sense to make recommendations back to the agency, I think that would be very useful. That, was, that is what made that summer travel management process possible, was a broadly-based public collaborative that provided an alternative to the forest supervisor 
who then signed, there was no litigation, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the role of collaborative efforts in this is going to be very important. Well, and to tear off that, we, we've done this pre-scoping effort. We wanted yeah. to really front load this process so that we could hear from everybody um, and get feedback before we started to roll into formal NEPA and had a more formal scoping process. We wanted to hear what was going on. Right. And would I be right to assume that it that it helps you guys enormously the more consensus there is in the comments? I mean, if, if, if comments are submitted with multiple agencies and stakeholder groups, does that help? That does help, absolutely. But the, the great thing about the travel management was actually the people were sitting in a room talking to each other, physically present. It wasn't just comments. It was, what can we do that we can all live with that we think is a good alternative? And the forest chose that. It really was successful. It's really a good thing. People aren't happy with it afterwards, the actual implementation, but it's it's they're probably a lot happier than they would have been otherwise. So that was it wasn't formal comments. It was it was people talking in the same room. Yeah, and I think really that's a, that's a significant key mm -hmm. to it because those nights mm -hmm. that were spent with the various interests in a room with maps in front of them, literally going road by road by road, and talking about the experience, talking about the use, talking about who goes there, and having all interests, sharing that type of information, and coming to consensus, and in many cases, agreement, about what was going into the alternative that that group was putting together, that was submitted to the core supervisor, was, was very significant. And, and you're right, there's a, there was an implementation, perhaps error afterwards, but the essence and the, and the, you know, the, the essence and the spirit of the collaboration led to a decision that was not litigated against. And that was a very unique situation that happened on the Indian National Forest. And in many cases, it's been held up as a potential example. The collaboration that went into it with everybody at the table, with maps in front of them, spirit of let's do this together and figure out a solution together um, went a long ways towards getting the decision in place. Yeah. However, yeah. my fear with this process, and sorry Dan, <laughs> my fear with this process, as was the major flaw of the travel management plan, and it was still a major flaw, is that it's being looked at as a travel management plan. The thousand miles of roads that was closed in the travel management plan were closed because they were unnecessary for transportation purposes. What they actually were was a thousand miles of recreational trails for the motorized community. So they didn't understand that they should have, but you know, people keep their head in the sand until after a decision is made, they complain about it. Um, the fact is when they saw the implementation and realized that what was being cut out was the recreation that they had been doing, myself included, for the last 50 years. It was unsettling. OSV on the forest isn't about travel, that's, which is why I felt that, that the process really didn't fit. This is a settlement to a lawsuit. Uh, this is not something the Forest Service would have gone through on its own. Um, are you able in this to look at the OSV use as other than transportation? Because it's not transportation, it is recreation. It should be handled out of the recreation side. So, you know, the people who would like to eliminate motorized recreation are using this as a tool to close further, sorry, on my stump now, um, to close more land. I have never seen a Forest Service process that didn't close more on the recreational side uh, or enhance motorized recreation in any way, shape, or form unless we were pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars into the coffers. Can, is this being looked at by the people within the forest as more than transportation, but as actually recreation trails and a means of recreation, because cross-country yeah. travel to the snowmobiler is hugely important, where right. in the summertime, yeah. we understand the need to be restricted to. Right, yeah, it's a, it is a totally different animal, and you're right, it is 100% recreation. Winter use, is, except for people that need to get to their cabin or whatever, which is not even considered in this, it's all recreation. Skiing is recreation. Snowmobiling is recreation. Cross-country skiing is recreation. It's all recreation. And that's why this is almost, in a way, harder because it is, it's values. It's, it's what people like to do for fun. It's not what <coughs> they need to do to get to where they're going. It's 
we all need recreation for how I'm not saying recreation isn't great. That's why a lot of us even live here. That's why I live here. But it, it is recreation. Yeah, you're right. I don't I don't know how that makes it that much different, but it, it, it is that something that we need. Yeah, Dana? Yeah, I, I have a question about timing. Um, the agency is currently going through its forest management plan revision process, mm -hmm. and, and there will be a decision made, uh, significant uh, impacts potentially in that decision. And then parallel to that, we have the OSB planning process taking place. Right. So is there, within the agency, is there an opportunity to coordinate how these parallel processes are taking place so that as the forest management plan decision is coming forward, it's not either usurping or, or I don't know, it's negatively impacting the OSB planning process. And it can OSB be on its path to be completed before the forest management plan decision is in place so that it can kind of feed into management plan. I, it's just a, yeah, it's a timing question. It is, it is. And, and I mean, we, we got this, we plan to do this, you know, five or six years ago, the OSB process. And forest plan division was going to be done. So that was the way this was originally planned. Um, we still want to go forward with, with subpart T because it's very important. And so we don't want to stop it because we don't know when forest plan division is going to be done. <laughs> we can't stop everything on the forest. Unfortunately, that thing could be 20 years before. I mean, it, it, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> but it could be five years before that thing gets a decision. You know, the, the forest plan division because lawsuits, basically. Um, and just because it's a long process. And so, yeah, so we, my boss is in charge of forest plan division for the forest. And every day I go talk to her about what I'm doing. I mean, not every day, but pretty much every day and what she's doing. And making sure there aren't big problems between the two of them. It is going to be a little weird because for example, recommended wilderness. Um, every forest, I mean, most forests haven't finished subpart C, but those that have tried, um, that's been close to snowmobile use. It's all snowmobile use, recommended wilderness. If we went the same way, we don't know what that's going to be. We don't have recommended wilderness on the forest now. It's all been wilderness. It's all wilderness now. So we can't say, here's a map of recommended wilderness that's going to be closed. We have to say, in the future, if it's going to be closed, it might look like any of these four alternatives or something in between. Um, so it's a little weird. But at least we're going to put it out there so the public knows this is going, what's going to happen in the future so they can might help determine how people uh, comment on forest plan and about recommended wilderness. But if they know to, that OSV is... To follow up with that, there's nothing, there's no wilderness, there's no, the 2012 planning rule doesn't apply to this, right? All the wilderness work is happening in the forest management. Right, so we have to follow our 88 plan in this. You're following the 88 plan? Yes, yeah, because we don't have a final new plan. Yeah. Oh, you you're, you're, your 88 management plan? Yeah, yeah, the 88 yeah. management plan. Not the planning rule. Oh, the planning okay. rule. Right. I, I don't even know. <laughs> but, but, but there's no, but as part of this process, you're not doing any wilderness recommendations. No, 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 absolutely not. No, no. All those I'm discussions saying, are happening in the management plan. That's happening oh. in the background. No, no, no. Okay. No. <laughs> um, yeah, good, good point of clarification. <laughs> yeah. And do you still have a question? Yeah, hi, I'm yeah. Bob Rowan with yeah. Snowlands. Uh -huh. And Bill, we've, we've talked before. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to correct two things. So I think as we start this process, it's important to not go into it. Misunderstandings. Um, this process actually is not as a result of the settlement of any lawsuit. Uh, Snowlands did have a lawsuit with the Forest Service. Uh, the settlement of that lawsuit did require Forest Service to go back and do some NEPA analysis in five forests, but the NEPA was not one of those five. So this is entirely separate from the settlement of the lawsuit. And the NEPA the National Forest is not required to do anything as a result of the settlement agreement the way those other five forests might have to. Um, you know, this, this process is the result of the change to the travel management rule, where subpart C, which had been optional, is now mandatory, uh, and that rule was changed as a result of a different lawsuit, but it wasn't settled. It was a court order requiring the foresters to go back and revise some part C. Um, and I understand your concern that 
travel management should look at access, but I think it's wrong to suggest that the travel management rule is primarily concerned with access. I think the travel management rule recognizes that <coughs> where roads are important for access, that's a really good reason to have a road there. But the travel management rule itself is the result of some ex executive orders issued back in 1974, where the primary focus actually was cross-country travel, not access. So the travel management tool really is very much about restricting motorized recreation, uh, although the fact that some roads are used for access is, of course, a very important issue and concern. We won't debate it here. Um, so I guess now, for those of you, well, oh, question, I'm sorry. You're looking at this, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's primarily the snowmobile use, but if you look at the lower snow years and you're down in other parts, there's, whether allowed or not, there's other non-track type vehicles out there playing still. Is that being looked at as ongoing option of either tire vehicles versus track vehicles? You know, you look at what's coming out in the industry stuff. And also, when, when it's incorporated uh, into other types of uses, like if you have a snowmobile used as part of your dog sledding use, it's when they're integrated, you know, both ways, or you know, it's the cats that go up and it's hiking and dinner and different things going on outside of just the primary use. Is it looking at that blended use in some of a lot of these areas, and how do you, you know, make that successful? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, yes, we definitely look at the blended use. And yeah, but the low snow years, is that area just going to be flat out closed on the roads at that point, or is it an area, how do you open those roads up? So, Close it up for snowmobiling, but it's dirt so you can't snowmobile. Yeah, I could take my Raptor out there. Right, and so I, I mean, the current, well, currently I think the rules about that are pretty confusing. Yeah, that's what Yeah, right, they so. don't. Um, you know, all that we, I think the only really, really specific one we have, I'm not sure, I'm not, but is you can't use wheeled vehicles on groomed snowmobile trails in a certain window of time. There's a right. there's certain dates. Correct. So if, it, if it's not groomed, because if it's nothing, not groomed, there's nothing to groom. Right. If it's not groomed, is it then yeah, open to those other uses? And I, I just think that's an area right. that gets addressed in this process. You're right. We should address that in this process, definitely. Yeah, because, it's, because it's confusing. And, you know, our, our guy will say, oh, these, these roads are wet, and these people are going out on them. And they're ruining the roads. It's too early for them to be out there, but there's no, I mean, we have a, I think we have a forest order that, you know, you won't harm resources. But if you're on a road, you know, you're not hurting animals or plants, you're on a road, but you're, 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 hurting, the road, you're hurting the road, and then we have to go back and, and do some major maintenance for people to write. So that, I mean, that piece, I think, should have been addressed in travel management, subpart B, because it's wheeled. <laughs> But it, it is a good thing, you're right. We do need to um, think about it <coughs> and make some more clear. Especially as we see, you know, the, the snowpack at these lower levels changing dramatically right. all the time, potentially. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you're going to end up with this multiple use type element here that we don't have a good mm -hmm. April 15th, it stops snowing, you know, <laughs> October 1, it starts snowing. Right. That's no longer. Yeah, there. you're right. And we, we do need to address that. I'm, I'm, yeah, in this, because <laughs> it is pretty confusing. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'd like to agree. I think that's an important issue that's come up in a bunch of the other forests. Is you've got a situation, perhaps on some roads, uh, where the non-motorized might be saying, "Look, that road should be for the OSVs. Let the OSVs use that." And the OSVs are saying, "We can't use it because there's wheel wheel vehicle use on there, and they mess it up completely." Right. So, and, and to the extent you help. can. Yeah. Consider wheeled vehicles as well in this process. Like that'd be very yep. helpful to getting a, a good resolution. The current forest order came about after we started the grooming program, and it was initiated specifically because grooming allowed wheeled vehicles out when there was a foot of snow, oh, right. mm -hmm. and then they would tear up the tracks. Um, I have photos of several different cars that have spent the winter <laughs> with, with Rick grooming around them because they've gone too far to turn around. Mm -hmm. 
the wheeled problems on the ungroomed have never existed because if there's really adequate snow for me to ride, unless you have put tracks on your side by side of your quad, you cannot go down that road. So Mother Nature herself, by rule on the forest, if you're a wheeled vehicle, you are restricted to the roads that are open. You can't cross country on a wheeled vehicle. So if you do that, you're illegal anyway. So it's really not a, a hugely important uh, <coughs> issue in terms of wheeled versus snowmobile, right, except yeah. on the groom trail. Right, right. My other question, that would be all track vehicles, right? One of the trends we're seeing now is more and more people are buying the tracks to go on, especially their side-by-sides. Mm -hmm. right. um, but then as soon as the tracks are put on, that would be an OSV Absolutely, and yes. no longer, and they would be allowed on the trail. Currently, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. which is fine. I have no problem. Yeah. I love to see people recreate, and I don't care how they do it. Right. Uh, I just want to comment on that. I mean, there is an issue that exists specifically like off the scenic route, where it's sort of like a pre groom condition, where before we start grooming, you know, those of us who like to either both, I both cross, cross stream scoot and snowmobile, right. get out on those trails off the scenic route, and there's people still out there logging, just destroying what's, you know, normally a road you know, like uh, access road in the summer, but it's got just enough snow and we just haven't started grooming it yet. There's no signage, there's nothing out there. And I actually spend half my my fall towing people out of that because they don't know and they just are like, oh, I'm gonna drive to city and though, and they get stuck. Right. And we just don't really do anything about that. There's no enforcement of that. And they just destroy, you know, kind of this pre groom condition before we officially start our grooming program because you know, we start grooming, we start grooming, not necessarily when the snow falls. Yeah, because he's required to have X amount of inches on the ground before he can groom. So there is that gap, gap mm -hmm. if you will, in the, in the uh, fall. Or even right now, if it yeah. melted out, there's tracks out there off the scenic loop where people, the burn goes down, when they start dropping out, they get stuck, they don't know, right. and then the trails are going to start. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joel, you might have the slide. Thank you. Uh, we heard a really amazing presentation last night about outdoor recreation, and uh, one focus of the presentation was on technology, innovation, really. And uh, in this context, um, so you're looking at noise, air pollution, and I wouldn't expect those issues to exist forever as it relates to this technology. And so you also alluded to, oh, that could take 20 years to do another document. Is there maybe any language or mechanism that could be built into this document whereby, it, you know, if a technology exists in the near future that didn't pollute air and wasn't noisy, um, you know, is this an opportunity to at least speak to that? And that there may be a section to say, well, if it's not going to be polluting air and it's not noisy, um, maybe it's an acceptable recreational activity. Um, anyway, I just want to, so that this doesn't become, you know, another obsolete document in a few years, um, which we, we have today. We have some documents that are obsolete based on innovation that's occurred. Yeah, um, and people would say our, our management now is obsolete because there's, I mean, people have said this, because snowmobiles cannot go a lot more places than they could in 1983. People also say it's obsolete because now we have more backcountry users because ATCs are so much cooler and lighter that now it's really accessible to more people that didn't want to carry heavy tally ski. Um, so, I, but I don't, you're right, and I mean, and some people have said, yeah, you, you, you know, there's other forests that have actually or maybe national parks, I'm not sure. Um, but I think other forests have said, in this area, that's an area that's used by a whole lot of people, only snowmobiles that are quiet, only a certain kind, they call them bat, so, you know, best available technology. Only quiet snowmobiles can go there. No one else can go there. So people have done that. Um, there's a precedent for that. Um, you know, as far as being outdated, you know, these plans, yes, they're set in stone, but, but they can be somewhat living. They, they can change through time as new things happen. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. And people have brought that up. And it's, it's definitely something to consider, but how we consider it is another question. 
I guess that's my question. How yeah, they it's, it's, it's <laughs> we're having a conversation with our line yeah. officers on Monday, yeah. so we're taking down questions as this goes along. But yeah, like we I have said, a lot to address. Those are some of the some of the things people have said. Is you know, some people have made suggestions about that. Some ones I just said. So those are public suggestions. Also, of course, there's suggestions. But we've we've heard that kind of stuff. So yeah, any other ideas we'd like to pitch you? Know. Since we're talking about obsolete documents, I wanted to bring one into the discussion here, kind of going back to this concept of having non-motorized groomed trails that are for, say, fat bikes and, and Nordic skiers. And so um, in other states in the country, um, a lot of these non-motorized groomed trails are funded by recreational trails program funding. In California, um, they, their guidelines for that program are, are fairly dated out of you know, 2007 and you know, kind of predated this, this real trend in um, groomed Nordic skiing and, and fat bikes. Um, they restrict the, um, the maintenance of those um, you know, for, for, um, projects that are funded under RTP. They, they restrict maintenance to only motorized projects. Um, and, and so that language needs to change if there's this possibility of having non-motorized room trails that are you know, um, managed or, or maintained by a partner organization. Because I, I see that capability here in this community very much, um, but it, it takes um, having some, some RTP funding assist, I think, for, for some long-term sustainability. So I'm just, I just want to put that out. That, yep. that's, a state, that's a state that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, state okay. of California, their, their guidelines for the RTP program, if they just need to remove one sentence and it would open up um, some availability for funding for, for grooming non-motorized trails. So again, so from a local perspective, so if the town were to say, hey, we want to provide a non-motorized uh, experience on a groomed trail, is this, does the town need to anticipate this and make these suggestions to this process? Because we would need to assume that the regulation of the of the maintenance device is going to be covered by this decision. Not necessarily. You're talking about non-motorized. Well, okay. Let's, I'm sure on this. Let's say we want to put and we want to provide a public. We want to expand our public Nordic program that's happening in Shady Rest. Now we want to start doing it over the Sherlands. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a group. We need a machine. We'll use local money, not state RTP, but local funds to groom that Nordic track out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, would we need to uh, provide you guys information of what we're thinking about, at least conceptually, now as part of this decision? Or to Joel's point, can this be added on later? Can that would be separate, totally separate decision. And will the town apply to a permit for the Forest Service and say, we want to go out and groom mm -hmm. this thing? Yep. Because we can't do that now. Right, yeah, it would be a new NEPA process. It wouldn't be this one because it, it's, it's totally separate. Um, We'd have to go through a whole NEPA process for that. Yeah. It might be a CE. It might be very easy. Right. NEPA does not mean it has to be hard or take three years like this. Well, it's, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay. But, yeah, it would, it would be separate because it's, this is about, this is about motorized. We can add a few things that are, that are kind of overlapping or kind of uh, attached to that. Right. Like, but so, so you're not going to consider a motorized maintenance vehicle a motorized vehicle for the purposes of what you're talking about? No, it wouldn't have to be part of it. Okay. Yeah, like we're not we're not analyzing um, Rock Creek going out and setting traps. We're not analyzing Tamarack going out and setting traps. Okay. Those are a separate permit and separate process. This is about public use. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the minimization criteria? Yeah, so the minimization criteria, um, I had something a little bit about it earlier, but the 2005 Cattle Management Rule says you will manage, you will, <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find I story. have it in writing, people yeah. can look at it. Let me, uh, <laughs> I know what it is in my head, but saying it out loud, I just want to make sure I say it properly. Um, there it is. Okay, so it says that we will, in, in basically, that's the part I can't think of. It's whether in designating areas or deciding about travel management, you will minimize damage to soil, vegetation, other resources, harassment of wildlife, conflicts between motor vehicle use and existing or proposed recreational uses, and among different classes of motor vehicles. So it says we need to consider that and we need to minimize it when we make these designations. 
Um, Before you can minimize it, don't you have to show an example of it being an issue? Right. Yeah. This Does doesn't say spend resources on so you you have watched this use now for over 20 years. So mm -hmm. you should have a lot of data on whether or not uh, environmental degradation is actually happening. Yeah. Uh, and we shouldn't spend a lot of money looking for something we've already been looking for for 20 years. It makes no sense. Use the data we have, and if there are true issues, then I'm assuming we would move forward with that mitigation. Yep. Yeah. Not that we have to mitigate before this happens, because it's been happening. Right. It doesn't say you can't have any effect to anything. That's not what it says. 50 years now. It doesn't say you can't have any effects to any other resources, and it doesn't say you can't um, you can't be noisy for quite. But the flip time. side, though, would be that you, have, you do have to document that there in fact is no effect, or that there hasn't been. Right. Yeah, and they've been right. doing that for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. I have no right. Problem. You have to have the data, and no one ever has enough right. to prove anything. But you can use what you have to to uh, to make good decisions. Um, so yeah, it says. Let's see. The responsible official, when designating trails or areas, the responsible official shall consider the effects on the following, with the objective of minimizing. That's the exact one. So is that? Is that yeah. What is that? Joel, I think you raised your hand again. Oh. You didn't? Okay, so for now, let's just, uh, we can uh, stick around until 1230, I think is the time allotted. Um, and then you can just talk to us individually, or like I said, look at the maps closer up, talk to each other. Um, that's all we have. So thanks for all for your.